Here we go. Hey everyone, welcome. Today we are doing the last chapter, chapter 12 of Unlearn Your Anxiety and Depression. So this is the FAQ, Frequently Asked Question, chapter. Let's see? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and start going through the slides just like normal if you want to participate in the chat. Just write something in there if you have um, something that you want to share or a question you want to ask. Okay, so like I said, this is the FAQ. And this one is such a good question. What about something like asthma, ulcerative colitis, or rheumatoid arthritis? Can these be forms of mind-body syndrome? And Dr. Schubner says he classifies chronic conditions in three categories. So there's one that's primarily degenerative physical conditions, such as cancer, strokes, and heart attacks. So that is one classification that although the mind plays a role in all illnesses, these are not primarily caused by thoughts or emotions, nor can they reliably be cured by changing our thoughts and emotions. There are some stories of people like Louise Hay who healed from cancer, but definitely you want to seek medical care if you have some of those kind of conditions and the mind, since it does play a role, this can help some. And then the second category occurs in younger people, has clear evidence of tissue destruction, yet also seem to be significantly influenced by the mind. These disorders include asthma, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, MS, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and other immune-related disorders. So when you think of it, the nervous system controls the immune system. So if the nervous system is in a lot of dysregulation, if you're in fear-based states a lot, then that can affect you know, your immune system, body can start attacking itself. I actually had ulcerative colitis and now am symptom-free, disease-free. And um, Dr. Sarno in his book, The Divided Mind, he says that ulcerative colitis is something that can be cured by it. And I didn't, you know, I didn't know that autoimmune wasn't supposed to be, right? So um, I think the more that we do more research, there'll be more and more proof that this work helps with these conditions more and more, but also there can be tissue damage that needs to be controlled by medications or under medical care. Um, so no evidence that changing the mind can reliably cure these dis disorders or tissue destruction will be reversed. So like for me, I have some scarring in, from the ulcerative colitis, but I don't have the symptoms or the chronic pain from it. Um, so it may be possible to reduce or eliminate exacerbations of these disorders, okay? So there's there's always still good evidence that doing this work will help everyone. And then on that note about the immune system, the brain can affect the immune system. It's called psychoneuroimmunology. And doing the mind-body syndrome work can not only calm the danger signal, but in some people also modulate the immune system to turn off an autoimmune response. I've even had someone, I think she was doing some mold testing or something, and they saw a change in her DNA after doing this work, a gene, they would say if it was being expressed or not, and there was a gene that was expressed and she had these symptoms. And then after doing these work and, and not having the symptoms, she did not no longer express that gene. So it's like can change us even at a genetic level. Um, so for people with these autoimmune disorders, it seems reasonable to use a combination of medical treatment and mind-body therapies. And again, I think what he mainly means by the medical treatment, like with my example, there was a time my, you know, ulcerative colitis was not in control. It was really bad and, um, you know, it was actually destroying the tissue. And so they did some steroids to like get my system calmed down. And then I took other medications for a while. And so you might combine, right? But 
also, <laughs> there's just so much evidence that um, is coming out. If you work with, or if you listen to Gabor Mate's stuff, he talks a lot about autoimmune being basically from trauma or, or a combination of little t traumas, right? Okay. Yeah, that is fascinating about the gene not showing up anymore, right? Yeah. So genes you know, can be expressed or not expressed depending on the environment. <laughs> it's crazy. Okay. I just did an episode last week with one of my clients, Renee, who is, um, she's in my group coaching program. She started this work a little bit before, but it's really just since like last fall that she's done this work and she has this whole list of diagnoses. Now, some of them like ankylosing spondylitis, she was never, she didn't test positive for it, but they, or whatever the test is. I mean, I don't know that one specifically, but there are several that, you know, they treated her as if she already had this because just having ulcerative colitis, you have a high chance of ankylosing spondylitis and you have back pain. So we'll just go ahead and say you have that and, and start treating you for that too. So some of these diagnoses were based, you know, on, she just had all the symptoms, but stiff person syndrome, ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, fibromyalgia, headaches, migraines, back pain, hip pain, anxiety, depression. She didn't currently have pelvic pain or interstitial st interstitial cystitis, but she had had that a few a couple years ago. Um, but it resolved before she actually found this work. Um, chronic fatigue, chest pain, high blood pressure. So she got off of 14 medications over this last year. And she is now, she went from bed and wheelchair bound to hiking like three miles and up terrain, um, things like bicycling again, things like carrying things and moving things in the garden and gardening. So she, um, and what she did actually was go through, you know, among other things, she went through this workbook and just did every single page, every single exercise. Um, so, you know, just because you have a diagnosis and it falls into one of those categories, one of the things I learned from Renee in that interview is just, she just had this really curious attitude of like, what if it's not? What if this isn't how I have to live my life? What if I don't have to, you know, be careful every time I bend over anymore? So, yeah. So anyway, those you. this isn't the standard, right? I wouldn't expect if someone gets out a consult call from me, I would never promise, oh, you, you'll be, you know, free of all your symptoms in six months because this happened to this one person. But, um, you know, it's, it's, get, it's inspiring. So I did want to share it and just plant that seed of like, okay, I could really argue that there's something structural and that's why my pain is there. And that actually makes me fear a lot. And I worry, and then I drive more pain, you know, that more pain is produced. But when you start asking things like, well, what if it's not, what if, um, you know, what if, because I was never actually diagnosed with it from the blood test or whatever it was, um, what if I don't have, have it or have to have it? Or what if, you know, like with fibromyalgia, it's basically part of the diagnosis is that you don't have any other medical thing they can find. So it's like, what if I don't have to always feel this way in the mornings anyway? Okay. And then the third, the third group back to the original question in the three groups, mind body syndrome and all of its varied manifestations, right? So it's kind of like a, a spectrum. And if you think of it's pure mind body at a hundred percent and, you know, maybe something like cancer, over at like it's zero, there's a whole range in between. And just from what I've seen, most people think they have something structural too, <laughs> right? It's like not uncommon to be like, well, I'm the one, you know, what about this for me? Does it, would this work for me? But again, just with that open mind of like, okay, maybe changing these personality traits, not only will it help me in my life and feel better about myself as a person. I'll also, you know, maybe that'll help this pain or this symptom. 
Okay. So I read that migraine headaches and fibromyalgia are genetic diseases. If that is true, how can they be caused by MBS? So some genes will cause specific disorders while others simply lead to a higher likelihood of a condition, right? So if someone has like down syndrome and they have a third chromosome, like that's something they have at birth. They, you know, most of the time display it, although there's kind of some mixed, but that one is probably like, like that's less likely to reverse, right? If they have an extra chromosome in all of their cells. But anyway, I don't know why I gave that example, but, but just thinking of, okay, what if, again, this is one of these genes that can be turned off. Like, has that ever happened for anyone with my conditions? Those genes in the latter group can be turned on or turned off during our lifetime. It's called epigenetics. And just, you know, you think about a cell in a stressful environment, and then you think about a cell in like that rest and repair state. And, you know, it's, it makes sense that that rest and repair one, that cell is going to be healthier and do, do better, you know? So, um, in migraine headaches, fibromyalgia, anxiety, and other disorders that I include under MBS, genetic factors only account for 15 to 40% of the likelihood of developing these disorders. So just notice if your brain goes to, well, that's, that's probably, you know, the group that I am, I'm in that minority, I'm in that 15%, um, less than 15%, but just think of it like, this is something our brains try to tell us to everyone. And the reason it's so common that almost everyone thinks they have some mix of structural and neuroplastic is that, you know, that's kind of the default of what we might believe. So just challenge it. Just keep building a case for yourself. As you notice all, all these things that are going on, noticing when you feel better, you can actually build your case that it is a hundred percent neuroplastic, but you don't, um, you don't always start with that full belief before you can do the work. Okay, so um, those genes do not cause those disorders, but can make it more likely to develop them if they're put in a situation in their life that triggers MBS. So stressful events in childhood, emotional stressors later in life. For me, like personality traits that came into play later in life. Like, you know, they worked when I was younger and then when I was a mom and I was working and it didn't help that I was just beating myself up and I was critical and I was trying to achieve a lot, right? Like that didn't help me in my life anymore. And that was stressing out my nervous system and my body was reacting by turning off my digestive system, right? So with this work, genes can turn back off, right? It's just crazy to think you can alter your genetics by doing this work, but that's the psycho neuroimmunology, right? Okay. So I get the impression from what I've read that understanding MBS processes is all that's necessary for healing MBS. For me, this does not seem to be enough. Understanding the process and uncovering the unconscious traumas or stressors seems to be only part of the puzzle because this has not led to improvement in my symptoms. Anyone else feel that way? <laughs> I hear that a lot. So it's common. You're not alone if you feel like that. Knowledge about MBS is enough to eliminate pain in, a prob in approximately 10 to 15 percent of patients. So this is that typical book here. You know, they read Sarno's book and then they never have back pain again, right? Um, that's that's the minority, 10 to 15%. So don't be sad if you're not in that group. And even if you are in that group, chances are if you don't resolve some of those personality and emotional things, it'll show up somewhere else and you'll have to deal with it then. So many other people eliminate MBS symptoms by reducing their level of fear and learning to move forward with their lives. That's the main thing in PRT, right? Reduce your level of fear, move forward with your life. MBS is caused by unresolved, emo unresolved emotions, and it's usually necessary to resolve them to get better. Many people also need to make changes in their lives, right? So this is a whole person program, right? This is not just like, 
okay, you have this symptom, do this and this and this to get the symptom to go away. You're like, how can I start actually changing my life um, so that I'm not in stress all the time, that I'm not um, carrying around all this emotional baggage from my childhood and that's stressing out my system because, you know, that takes so much of my energy, right? So like I always say, this work is so good to do, even if you didn't have pain. So doing it with that sense of like, okay, this is like a self-development course <laughs> and um, this is going to reduce the fear and help me move forward with my life. Um, okay, so that's good. Okay, everyone gets pain from time to time. How will I know if pain is really MBS or something that requires medical attention? This is a frequently asked question. Do I need to be concerned that I'll hurt myself if I exercise again? So just ask yourself, is this something I fear? Am I thinking about this? So here are some clues that an acute pain, which is a new pain less than three months old, is actually caused by MBS. A good, good clue is that it occurs without an injury. So if you're playing pickleball and then the next day you get pain, then you want to really think, okay, if I broke a bone, wouldn't I kind of know it? It wouldn't show up the next day because I'm so unaware. Like if there's an injury, you feel it most of the time, right? The logic doesn't always work. If you're running away from a bear, you might not feel that pain. But um, if you, definitely if you're just like, oh, I felt nothing. And then, you know, a week later I got this pain. You don't tie it back to that. It occurs when another MBS pain gets better. Okay, so you're in this extinction burst period where back pain decreases, anxiety increases. Back pain decreases, old shoulder pain that I haven't had for so long is back and the tooth pain is back or whatever, okay? So good, good clue. And or it occurs after some stress or emotion. I found a lot of people will stress kind of like a week before a trip or having to take care of their mom for that week or, um, you know, even fun things coming up, you might stress about before and you might start to have some pains. And then definitely if you're like, yeah, there's a stressful thing in my life. Well, really good clue that you also didn't just injure yourself. You are fine, but your brain is producing those uh, signals. Okay, but what if you're like, well, my pain did occur while exercising. I, you know, stepped this way, my knee twisted, I felt pain. So that's hard, hard to know for sure. If it heals within a few days or so, it was probably a mild injury that just needed time to heal. If you do work out too hard and you get delayed muscle, delayed onset muscle soreness within a few days or a week, you will feel better, <laughs> right? Um, but sometimes people's pain persists because they have a lot of fear about it. So if it persists for a longer time than expected, then it's probably MBS. Doesn't have to be the full three to six months before you start thinking that. But really investigate the symptom. Have this detective's eye. See if it varies with stress, if it's inconsistent with a physical injury, right? If you're like, mm, I hurt my leg and the whole top to bottom of my leg is hurt. You know, like that's, there's not one muscle that runs there. Um, better or worse at times unrelated to certain movements or activities. And again, you might say, well, mine is with a certain activity, but we know that that can just be predictive coding, right? It doesn't mean that every time you raise your shoulder and you get pain, that something structural is going on in there because your brain can learn that and produce it, right? So one time I had this pain when in this joint, this last joint of my finger, when I would move it like that. And I started thinking like, oh my gosh, maybe there's arthritis. And it was just with movement. Maybe it's gout. You know, it feels like it, crystals might've formed in there, right? My brain was going to everything. 
And then I would just watch it, right? I was just like, maybe it's MBS. I would think that too. And so I was like, it's probably that because I'm that kind of person, right? That has things show up in their body. So I kind of noticed it and it would be on for like a day or two and then off for a while. And one time I had that and some jaw pain the same day. And I'm like, I think I just need to journal. And I started writing some stuff out and really realizing some things I hadn't realized were stressing me out. And I kid you not, after that, my that finger, when I would move it, stopped hurting. And the jaw pain later that day, I think, went away. So just because the <laughs> moral of the story is what I was trying to tell you is just because it does only occur with a certain movement and it's reliable and it's not because you're stressing when you're thinking of it, you can tell you're not super stressed. You know what I mean? Just keep that open mind. Keep watching it. Build up the amount of exercises you do gradually and you should have no problem as long as you keep reminding your body that it's strong and healthy and it can tolerate exercise without any problems. So you know that graded exposure technique, it's starting with just visualizing it. So imagining that you're doing the workout, that you're feeling good, you're happy, smile on your face in real life when you imagine it, right? You're prepping your brain for safety. I like to just have people start really small with something they feel comfortable with, right? If I just asked you, how many minutes do you think you want to walk? You know, and if you're like, really just a couple let's start with that right just start easy um but a lot of people do have that fear of movement and a fear of overdoing it because they've had it happen before where they can't tell that they're overdoing it and then they have pain but what if you know it's not the pain that has come from an injury it's this fear based pain Okay, so why is it so important to believe that the program will work? What if I'm skeptical? Will that undermine my likelihood of success? Such a great question, right? Do I have to believe it 100%? So all treatment regimens, including exercise, medications, and surgery, work better if the patient believes in them. So even if you can get a little gem or a little you know, seed of belief, that's what I was trying to think, a little seed of belief, chances are you you are going to do better already right but and he says this program is not a placebo it's based on research and, and just good medicine find the source of the problem deal with it in a straightforward and powerful manner so again even if you don't fully believe but you're like okay i don't have to believe to calm my symptom, but I am going to see what's going on with my emotions and my stress level and the problem and deal with it. It will be more difficult to be cured if you don't believe that MBS explains why you have your pain. It is. So neural circuits of pain are in the subconscious mind and are reinforced by worry, fear, and uncertainty. Right? So your fear is driving those exact same symptoms that you're afraid of and then you feel it more and then you get more afraid and then you feel it more so you must clearly understand that the source of the pain is due to mbs that emotional reactions to stress have caused the pain and that mental processes can reverse the pain so keep finding evidence for yourself keep doing what resonates with you to show yourself that you're safe. Um, and it will change over time and you don't have to hundred percent know it yet, <laughs> but that's the goal you're working towards is like a detective. If you were trying to make the case that someone did it, you would want to look for every single clue and you want to make that case for yourself that it is neuroplastic because if not, you're probably worrying and having fear <laughs> about your symptom, thinking that it's structural, right? Okay, should I stop taking my pain medications for this program to work? What about my medications for depression or anxiety? It's fine to take medication for pain, anxiety, or depression while you're working on the MBS program. It's very common for the brain to increase symptoms when fear arises, as we were just saying, 
such as may occur when reducing or stopping a medication, right? So usually what I'll do is just ask my clients, like, how do you feel about it if they bring it up, right? And then sometimes they're like, oh, I want to, but I'm just really scared to, you know, that's when you want to start really, really, really small. Let's see, if, you know, what your doctor says about decreasing it by, you know, 0.1 or whatever it is, just like small a stretch, but not a stress. Um, so if you get a lot of stress thinking about stopping the medication, then now's not the time to also throw on, you know, stopping the medication along with all the other work. Better just stay on the medication that you're on until it feels comfortable to start to decrease that or let that go. I think of it like training wheels and you want to get really safe and secure with those training wheels on first until you try taking them off. There's a nocebo effect. It's opposite of the placebo effect. So a nocebo would be like, you're likely to feel really drowsy and sick to your stomach if you take this pill, <laughs> right? And then you do. And um, so that can occur if you stop medications too early, or if your doctor says your condition is uncurable, right? If anyone has ever said that to you, you might have that idea in your head of like, I really do believe this will never get better because it's uncurable, but it's uncurable to the medical system and their approach. If you decide to reduce a medication dose, Make sure that you remind your brain that lowering doses will not harm you and that you are safe and confident that you'll be okay. This will prevent your brain from activating the nocebo response. There's a phrase like hurt, but not harmed. And if you're like, okay, of course I'm gonna feel some feelings now and then, uh, sensations. Um, if I'm decreasing the meds, that could happen or maybe not. And if I do, um, it's just, like, okay, it's temporary, won't be here very long. Um, oh, and yeah, the hurt but not harmed, right? It's like, I feel sensation, but it's not like injury, damage to the tissue. It's just uncomfortable and it'll, it'll pass. Okay, I've been told I need physical therapy in order to stretch and strengthen my body. Should I continue it or will that deflect attention from the MBS to something physical? What about exercise? How much should I do? What about posture? What holds people back is pain and fear of pain. So work through the fear and pain by gradually increasing the amount of exercise that you do. So again, just notice for yourself, am I doing this exercise with a lot of fear of pain? It doesn't induce pain. Um, you'd probably want to start smaller, start with that visualizing first and do that until you can do it without imagining any pain for yourself. As far as the PT, if you are doing it, tell yourself frequently that your body is strong, that you are healthy. There's nothing wrong with your body and that you are doing this to get stronger, right? Like, okay, I'm just doing this to get stronger. Um, but I'm not diseased. I'm not unhealthy. I have a strong, healthy body that even though it has, you know, this bulging disc, almost half the people my age do too, right? <laughs> if your physical therapist reinforces the idea there's something wrong with your muscles or joints, this can delay your recovery time from MBS. So try to find a PT who understands or a trainer or even a coach can walk you through this graded exposure process so that you feel more safe with it as you reinforce, my body's strong and healthy. My body is stronger than I think it is. Okay. Our bodies are made to be used and they are not actually damaged by poor posture. Okay, so try to recognize when you have those thoughts about posture causing pain, bad posture, weak core, weak glutes. None of that has been proven to be true. Okay. There's many people with weak abs who do not have back pain. If you strengthen your abs and 
you don't have back pain, it's probably more because you did something. You feel like you're in control. You, you know, took an action that you believed would help. And so that calms your nervous system. It can be uncomfortable to be in one position for an extended period of time, but when you change your posture and move about, the body is reset and any symptoms go away. So just reminding yourself, if you're like, but there's real pain if I, you know, keep my neck at like this for 12 hours, it's like, okay, well, um, <laughs> you know, of course you wouldn't keep it like that unless you had no sensation coming back to you of like, Hey, you should move. But if you start to trust your body intuitively knows, you know, when that foot has been twisted for too long or right, it knows and signals to you, okay, shift around in your seat a little wiggle. So start to, to notice how your body knows how to do that. And don't worry about being in perfect posture all the time that will drive your symptoms. Some days I have a couple of hours a day to spend on the program, but some days I don't have any time. Is it okay to work on one week one's material for two weeks rather than one? You can go at your own pace. Find a good balance, but be sure to make time to work on the program so you get its benefit. You deserve to get better and you need to take time in order to do the work that's required. Okay, so I don't know if you found that working on this stuff every day is a lot, but, um, you know, some days you're just like, I don't really have time to cry today, <laughs> you know, or I don't want to, you know, like I don't have the mental capacity to sit down and really do an exercise today. Um, you might've heard of that program that I'm going to be doing starting next week. We're going to take the 28 day program and spread it over 12 weeks. So three months, it'll be going all during the summer, and I've made it so that you only have to do exercises four out of seven days per week, and you'll still complete the whole thing in over the summer, right? So um, if, if you're the kind of person that does better with a little bit of a system and a strategy and accountability, um, there'll be like coaching opportunities, group coaching, personal coaching. I can tell you more about it. Um, but anyway, that would be one alternative. That's something that I came up with as like an addition to this book group to help you actually put it into practice, actually do it. Um, so generally there's no harm in kind of taking your time to do it. That's better than being super urgent and expecting yourself to do it all in 28 days and then beating yourself up when you don't, or if you don't. Okay. Oh, so such a good one. How do I deal with people who doubt the MBS concept? They're always telling me to go to the doctor again, see if there's a physical problem. This makes me doubt myself. And then I find my pain is worse. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. So sometimes that person lives with you. It's like your spouse and you constantly feel like, uh, am I doing the right thing? Because his way sounds logical too. And what if, you know, I can't explain it and and so it doesn't make sense to him. And, and now I'm doubting myself. Doubts are common. If it makes your pain worse, then you know it's MBS. Many people don't understand MBS. It's probably a good idea not to discuss this with them. Okay. This might not be what you're expecting. Um, but it's true that when you start to talk about something and you're not convinced of it yourself, and then someone has another opinion, it's very easy to start to sway over to their side and go back to like traditional medicine, what we've been raised with, what sounds normal. You know, this does sound crazy, right? Whatever it is. So just notice what sta stage of this you're in. And if you're like feeling really defensive about having to talk to someone about it or, or it's uncomfortable, you can just say to yourself, like, I don't have to talk to them about that just because they ask how I'm doing. You know, I might just say, oh, I'm like trying some new things to, uh, you know, you might just say nothing, honestly, however you want to say it. Um, Cause I was like, you might not want to bring up that you are trying something. Right. But when people do say something, something they say is just usually very simple, right. Something that's just like, oh, I'm just really working on managing my stress and that actually helps my pain so much. <laughs> and maybe, you know, you don't say repressed emotions because then people are like, what? But I just say like, oh, when we lower the stress, the pain goes down. 
Oh, and Jennifer says it really helps to be part of a Facebook group where you can talk to people that understand. Yes, exactly. So tell me about your pain um, is the Facebook group that Alan Gordon, if you've heard his podcast, he's the one who wrote The Way Out. So he has a podcast called Tell Me About Your Pain. And there is a private Facebook group. It's free, but you do have to answer some questions to join and agree to the rules. Um, and and part of the rule is that we don't offer medical solutions, right? Like this is a brain-based group. And so if someone starts saying, oh, well, you know, you should take uh, this medicine works really well, or, um, you know, it really is that your hip is out of alignment or something, we'll like take those posts down so that it's really focused on the brain-based healing, the nervous system-based stuff, not, you know, well, what about this? Consider this, you know, we're not getting advice from all over the board. So yes, I think the Facebook group can, there's moderators like myself and a few others that can give you answers to your questions with this language, with this, um, it is like a foreign language, with this foreign language that we're all learning and you're learning. Okay, and if you're feeling like you're not good at explaining it yet, chances are you can just say something simple and then turn the question back to them. Uh, you know, I'm I'm doing the stress lowering to, to work on my symptoms. Oh, hey, I heard you got a new dog. How is that? Right, so you just turn it back to them. People love talking about themselves and you'll shortly find that you don't have to talk about things just because someone asked. I'm just starting my first week of this course and I have a question about reprogramming the mind. I think it's a key to my recovery as I've identified some strong triggers that I have not been able to keep from causing my symptoms in the past. Most of the triggers are involved with work and they make doing my job difficult while also causing me fear. How can I deal with these triggers? Is that anyone else here? <laughs> fear of something that like gets triggered when you're doing something like work that you need to do to earn money. So realize that triggers are things that can initiate symptoms, but they're not directly causing them. So you don't need to eliminate the trigger, just the connection you're making, right? That fear response of I might hurt myself, that's causing the pain, not the actual thing you're doing at your job. So figure out why work is a trigger for you. Look at any issues that are occurring at work and figure out if you can continue to work there and what things you can do to change. Find ways of stopping your pain at work. Persistently talk to yourself prior to going to work while entering work and at work. So back to that first one, find ways of stopping your pain at work. What I think he's talking about um, is like the, what's it called? The um, predictive coding. Oh, sorry, no, avoidance techniques. Find ways of stopping your pain at work. You want to use avoidance techniques is what they call them. I don't love that phrase because it makes it sound bad, like you're avoiding. But sometimes, you know, you get your pain at work and you do take an ibuprofen because you have to finish your work and you don't want to have that headache or whatever it is, right? So it's totally fine to use that pillow at work or to um, take breaks from your keyboard, right? Or whatever it is do things logically that help your pain right now as you're also reminding yourself, okay, it's not the computer. I have a lot of doctors that like they get their pain when charting and they're doing the computer. And then we get into what they're thinking and they're thinking things like, I hope I don't mess this up. Someone could die if I write the wrong thing, if I give the wrong prescription, right? So their charting pain is not actually from the computer at all. Tell your mind that your body doesn't need to have these symptoms anymore. Get immersed in your job. Stay focused on doing the very best you can. Focus on enjoying any aspects of the job that you can and be grateful for having a job. Okay, so there might be some benefits to your job, like they pay you money and you do need money to live in the world. So that might be one thing that you like about your job. That might be the only thing that's easy to see but if you keep like a detective finding clues of what you like about your job, then you switch your mindset to looking for what you do like, and that will decrease your fear, the danger signal that'll decrease your pain, right? So maybe there's just like 
you know, I love, it doesn't have to be I love. I like, <laughs> I like that um, I don't have to take a break during lunch and I can work through my lunch and go home early. Or I like that I have an hour break for my lunch and I can meditate while I go, you know, while I do my own thing, right? You could be like, I like the all, my job outline is so clear. I always know exactly what I'm supposed to do. I don't like having to do it, but I, but I like that. I know, you know, they're, they're very clear about what's needed or something. I don't know. You can just be creative. Okay. You can make the decision to find another job and leave. And that can help you to know that you're not trapped. You have an exit strategy, but remind your brain um, like if you can't immediately do that, remind your brain that you'll look out for yourself and take care of yourself, that this will not be forever, that you'll be able to handle it until you can leave. Right. So sometimes we know like in, in coaching, you might say, oh, it's the job that's giving me all this stress. And if I just get another job, then I'll feel better. Or if I just had a different relationship, then I'd feel better. And sometimes we don't have to actually change the situation. If we change how we're thinking about it enough, um, then it actually changes how we show up and how they show up. And all of a sudden, you know, things that were unbearable before become pleasant, right? So usually, you know, this happens when you go to your next job or relationship and you have the same kind of boss, you have the same kind of boyfriend, right? So you can just leave and change and leave and change every so often, but also, you know, start exploring what it is in you that gets triggered by this kind of work environment. Um, Cause maybe it's just an old, old pattern, right? Of like, I, I fear when someone raises their voice because of this that happened in my childhood. And now I just see he's Italian. He's just loud. He's not actually being mean, right? But a lot of times we'll have symptoms, Dr. Schubner said, because you feel trapped. So if you're feeling trapped in any of these life situations, caring for your parent, whatever it is, um, start to look at that too. Know that you're not trapped. Start to find resources to help you. Learn to relax and not worry if symptoms develop because the more you worry, the more symptoms. I know that's like the worst news. So if it does develop, don't beat yourself up. But um, also if you do have a new symptom, that's when it's really important to just be like, okay, where can I do that belief work, that emotional work, whatever it is to just soothe myself and get through this and um, know that this is just another mind body thing. Hurt, but not harmed. It, they may hurt or be uncomfortable, but they won't harm you. After starting the program, I'm finding that my symptoms are getting worse. Am I doing something wrong? This has made me be anxious and that seems to make my pain worse. I'm also feeling depressed and tired. Should I stop the program or go slower with it? Okay, you're, you're, it could mean you're doing it right. It's common for symptoms to become worse or for new symptoms to emerge when starting the program, especially with the writing exercises. So it's uncovering emotions that have been buried and so, yeah, you can have some symptoms, you can have some new ones, you can have some old ones, your pain can be worse, it can turn to anxiety or depression and tired. And that can just mean, okay, you're on the right track. <laughs> I know it sounds counterintuitive. Second, the mind is, ca is catching on that physical symptoms are from unresolved emotions. It will tend to create other symptoms to keep you off track or scare you into stopping this work, right? If you could just start believing, oh wait, there's that um, thing that they thought was autoimmune again. I'm getting those symptoms. I'm getting, you know, if you start to say, oh, I'm getting these anxiety symptoms and you know, that's a really scary one for me, then, then you'll stay on that topic and not do this work, right? The, the primitive brain wants to stay, stay with what it knows and what it's comfortable with rather than what could happen if you start to open yourself up to feeling emotional pain. 
your mind is trying to give you the message that this work is hard or too scary. When this work causes your symptoms to change, you are clearly on the right track. You need pain or anxiety medication for the short term. That's fine. Also consider a counselor. So again, lots of therapists and coaches out there that work specifically with this because even that Renee that I told you about that story, she she's in my group coaching. So she would come maybe once a week or every other week. But a lot of times she had a question about stuff, how to apply it. And there were some times she came and she was like, this is not working for me. I have these new symptoms now. She's, you know, like feeling like she wants to quit. So having someone who can just ride that storm with you, so helpful. You can write to the negativity and depression, talk to it, tell it that you know what it's trying to do. Okay, write to any of those symptoms or emotions. Okay, this one I talk to people about a lot because it's so common. I'm either waking up in the middle of the night or I wake up with pain or I can't sleep, or I can't get to sleep, or I can't get back to sleep. How can I deal with those things which are occurring while I sleep? So it's necessary to deal with your subconscious. Just have that in mind. This is a subconscious time. Sometimes people are like, well, when I'm asleep, I'm relaxed. Well, not not, not really. <laughs> if your subconscious is stressed from things during the day, then chances are at night it won't be resting. So before you go to bed each night, write out a list of the things on your mind and write, I'll deal with this tomorrow. I'll not worry about them all tonight while I sleep. So you could even do two columns and write this and say, I'm not going to worry about the, you know, car payment and while I sleep, I'm not going to worry about whatever until not till tomorrow, not till while, you know, not while I'm sleeping. Then do a meditation or visual visualization before you fall asleep, have a little chat with your brain and it's danger signal. Let it know that you're okay, that you're going to be okay. And that there are no major issues that need attending to tonight. Please or tell your brain it can keep you awake or wake you up as it pleases, but you're not afraid of that. So you might have to do a lot of thought work about this, about like changing your thoughts about sleep. If you think that, oh, I need to get sleep. It's so urgent. That's going to keep you up more. So if you do this, you're telling your brain, I like to tell myself things like, um, it's restful just laying here with my eyes closed. It's a form of rest. My body will get the rest it needs when it needs it. Sometimes I've had a day where I didn't get a lot of sleep, but I still felt kind of good that day because I was doing something enjoyable. Um, and then, yeah, the other one I really like is just realizing like your body actually can change the sleep pattern depending on what you need. So if you've gone without REM sleep for a while, you just start to fall asleep and you'll start to have a dream. So, so knowing, right, this body has this way of compensating. If it gets tired enough, eventually it'll sleep. It isn't actually hurting me to get less sleep for a night or two here or there, right? So as you are less urgent about needing sleep, you'll get to sleep better. If you don't sleep well, okay, you'll sleep better over time. If you don't sleep well tonight, you'll sleep better tomorrow night or the next day, right? Because you'll be so tired. You're like, okay, I'll just sleep better tonight, tomorrow night. Do this each night for two weeks and you'll sleep better and your morning pain will lessen or go away. The other thing you can do is that graded exposure, imagining yourself waking up without pain, getting up out of bed, smile on your face, feeling happy, feeling grateful, what you do in the morning, you visualize that without pain, super powerful. Question, I was doing really well when I started the program. My pain was going down and I was beginning to feel good for the first time in several years. Then my pain returned and now it seems worse than ever. What did I do wrong? I'm worried that it won't go away again and that, it'll, that I'll be stuck back where I was. What should I do? You guys ever felt this? Are you feeling that right now? Understand that setbacks occur in most people, right? Even Renee's story, she had some setbacks. First, be kind to yourself. Don't beat yourself up or blame yourself for the setback, right? You didn't do something wrong. 
you you didn't it doesn't mean you did something wrong because you have pain stop thinking that be compassionate and kind to yourself this is the hardest thing to do sometimes but this is part of the work don't let fear overtake you that will lead to more pain i know it gets scary do what you can go back through this book build that evidence talk to people who believe in this build that evidence from people who know how to help you Sometimes the danger signal in the brain just falls back into default while circuits of, of circuits of pain for a while. So I think of it as like, sometimes you're expanding and that can feel dangerous, right? Like I, I might want to send an email to um, someone proposing something and I don't want to get rejected. And so I start going into freeze. I start feeling belly symptoms, gut symptoms, right? So it is just like a default mode. And that's my cue of like, oh, Betsy, you're starting to stress about something. Oh, you're thinking of something wrong here. Um, you're thinking of it is misinformation. It's not dangerous. Sometimes the brain ramps up symptoms before they go down. That's that extinction burst phenomenon. You know, that rabbit or the rat or mouse that was pressing the button for food and then the button stops delivering food, they don't just stop pressing the button immediately. They, they press it more, they press it faster, right? So that your brain and nervous system could be going through that type of uh, rewiring, right? That you're in the extinction burst phase. You'll be fine soon. Be assertive and continue to do more physical activities. Do the writing and the meditations. Don't fall into seeing yourself as a victim. Develop confidence in yourself and in your ability to heal yourself. This shall pass. You'll get better. I'm confused about what foods I should eat. I've gotten conflicting information. Some say to avoid wheat and dairy products. Others say to go organic or vegan. Does food cause or aggravate bodily pains? That's a good one. Foods are common triggers for MBS. Many people resolve their reactions to foods by simply applying the reprogramming the brain techniques in this book. Food may cause microinflammation. This level of inflammation does not cause body pain. So even if they're like, these are really inflammatory foods, sugar's so inflammatory. Okay, there's a lot of inflammation going on in our bodies at different times. Dr. Schubner talks about microinflammations and that that does not cause mind-body symptoms. From the MBS point of view, it's important to understand that you can eat whatever you want, whatever feels good, whatever makes you happy. It will make no difference in pain or MBS. Many people worry too much, right? So again, take this at your um, slow stretch, but not stress pace. Um, Cause you can, you know, sometimes have some symptoms that you're expecting to have when you start introducing that food back. But really start to see, you know, if if it really makes you um, feel weird to not have cake when everyone else is having it and you really like cake and want to have a piece for someone's birthday, that could get to be less stress for you than, you know, oh, the inflammation and I can't eat this and I feel deprived and I hate that this is happening to me, right? Okay, so eventually getting to that point of just challenging kind of one belief after another until you start to see those patterns and prove it for yourself. My, why does my mind come up? Oh, and that's to say, I have heard him say, like, if you have a peanut allergy, like, don't test this out, right? If you're like, if you have like a diagnosed um, allergy that you need an EpiPen for, that's not what we're talking about here. We're just talking about foods and digestion problems and pain and, you know, all the things people say, leaky gut. I, I have, you know, a sensitivity to gluten, you know, maybe, right. If you have, uh, what is it? Uh, celiac. He does talk about celiac as being more of a kind of structural thing. So, but most people, again, maybe weren't officially diagnosed. They are just diagnosed based on the symptoms. So they, I know my daughter based on her own, you know, oh, I have lactose intolerance because her tummy is like mine when she gets stressed and she's connected it to the dairy. But I've also seen her when we're on vacation, eat a milkshake at the beach and be fine, right? Um, so why does my mind come up with new symptoms while I get rid of the old ones? When will it give up? Most people are like, okay, 
one goes, one comes, one goes, one comes. Is this going to be the whole rest of my life at this intensity? So the diagnosis of MBS is confirmed. Um, so if you if you come up with new symptoms, basically this is good news, right? Um, a structural area problem in one area wouldn't move around like that. You've got it on the run. It could also mean you haven't yet integrated the changes that you need to make in your life or in your psyche. And I also see this as like, I'm evolving, I'm growing, I'm sending out an email where someone could reject me. And part of my brain is like, hey, that's dangerous. You should feel really crappy so you can't go write that email, <laughs> okay? You haven't yet accepted yourself fully and completely. So this is number three reason this might happen. You're still fighting yourself, doubting yourself, being afraid of symptoms or certain issues or events in your life. So just, you know, keep with compassion, turn to that. Four, you haven't yet learned what you need to learn from your symptoms, right? They'll, they'll kind of keep coming back until you learn to stop putting so much pressure on yourself in that way, maybe. The brain can easily fall back into the danger mode because it's used to doing that. Basically, it's a habit of your brain. Habits can change and your brain will do this less and less over time as you continue to calm your brain. Remind yourself that you're okay and focus on living the best life that you can. So when you're thinking, oh my gosh, all these symptoms keep happening one after another. If it's not this, it's another thing. Um, that is a stressful thought that's catastrophizing to think I'm always going to have this. Oh man, this is going to be so bad. That's catastrophizing. So just notice if you're catastrophizing, if you're getting upset about the future, just come back to the present moment one day at a time. Almost everyone gets symptom substitution. And if you're able to recognize it quickly and even laugh at the new symptom, it'll go away so much faster. So isn't it funny that my body thinks it can get away with trying that one? That happened to me where I'd seen a picture of a tooth that had been, um, I was getting an implant on it. And so just seeing that picture where I had a gap, my brain started creating pain in that tooth later that day and it spread up into my face. And that's when I was like, oh, this is, I mean, I already knew like this is because I, I just saw that picture. My brain doesn't want that to happen again. You know, it's spreading. So that's a sign it's MBS. How do I deal with anxiety? I worry if I'm going to get better and if this pain will come back, right? It's like, okay, I'm feeling good. Now I'm going to worry that it's going to come back. <laughs> it's what our brain does, especially when it uses anxiety as a symptom substitution. When anxiety occurs, it means that emotions are less suppressed. So accept that you have these feelings at times. So again, that's kind of like good news, right? Okay, my emotions are less suppressed. Now I'm feeling them. I don't love it, but... At least I'm not suppressing them anymore, except that you have these feelings at times. There are reasons for them and they are normal. Then treat anxiety just as you've learned to treat the pain. Oh, and Jennifer, I like to think of it as pain, like exercising a new muscle. It's good pain, right? Okay, so like the, the things like before with the symptoms, you're like, oh, okay, this is how I feel when I expand sometimes, when I evolve, when I work out, when I grow. There's meditations of just thoughts, you know, just labeling it as just thoughts, stepping into fear on Ron Ronald Siegel's website, embracing emotions meditation. And then you talk about forgiveness, but isn't that condoning what someone else did? Forgiveness has little to do with the other people, whether they deserve to be forgiven is irrelevant. If you're not forgiving, allow the other person you're allowing the other person to control you and continue to hurt yourself or hurt your, <laughs> ah, hurt you. Sorry. <laughs> you're basically deciding to hurt yourself. So forgiving, you actually assert your power to choose how you think and act. So if this is still tender for you about forgiveness, it might be really helpful to talk that through with someone because no one is trying to victim blame or, um, cause any more stress than you already need. So forgiveness is to help you. But if you, you know, if, if it doesn't come easy, it doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. Just means that's a hard thing that it'll be so nice when you, you know, resolve it and feel better about it for your sake.
Why do the symptoms of MBS keep coming back after they get better? Is my mind that persistent? Yes, your mind is very persistent. MBS is like a child throwing a temper tantrum. If you can completely ignore the child and not react with fear or worry, this will get the tantrums to stop, at least temporarily at first. And then the child will continue to test you with that extinction burst, right? If you've had kids or witnessed people with young kids, you know that when there's a tantrum, you want to do anything you can to stop it. But then the kid learns, okay, if I tantrum, then I get this. And you're just like, okay, new strategy. Don't react to the tantrum. And the kid learns it's not effective. It doesn't help. They stop doing it. You're human and you'll always be human. Having some mind-body reactions from time to time is simply, simply part of being a human. Everyone has them to some degree. If you can accept yourself as being human and not perfect, if you can accept yourself as being okay, just as you are, if you can accept yourself as doing the best that you can, then you will gradually calm the danger signal in your brain and be the person that you were meant to be. So cool. Okay. I don't think we have a ton of time. Oh yeah. We're over on time, but I wanted to mention again, that club, book club integration group, the um, three month program that I'm starting next week. It's 12 weeks focusing on doing the exercises from the workbook, slower pace, just four out of seven days per week for exercises. You can pick which days and less pressure to try to do something every single day. You'll have access to my group calls. They're Tuesdays and Thursdays. You don't have to go to those. If your summer's already busy, that's just for like, like workshop or like a what do they call it? Office hours, right? You can come in if you want. And six one-on-one -on -one calls with me. So every other week, a uh, one-on-one -on -one call with me. Um, so the total for that program for the three months is a thousand dollars. And that includes those six one-on-one -on -one calls to keep you on track, to process, to do the somatic work, some of the trauma healing, all that stuff. And then the um, videos. I'll send a video each week and a little workbook for the week. So anyway, if you're interested in that, oh, thanks, Angela. She says she enjoys your book club. Okay. I'm so glad. Um, yeah. And then I'll just keep you guys informed about what book, um, if I'm going to do another one, what book it is. Um, I have some ideas, but sometimes I take a little break between the book clubs. So, um, just keep your ear out and I'll let you know on social media or in the email group. So thanks you guys for coming. Have a great rest of your day and hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.